and co-founder of the Rescue and Humane Alliance of Los Angeles, Scott Sorrentino. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. I know that uh, a lot of you have adoptions today or uh, adoptions tomorrow or this weekend, so it's a, it's quite a, uh, it's, it's wonderful that you've taken the time to come out today. And um, far be it from me to ask any of you, um, especially those of you who um, are, are uh, daily involved in rescue, to do any more than you're already doing. You are definitely the doers in the community, and the fact that you've uh, come here also shows that you're also interested in the bigger picture. Um, and uh, I think we all should give ourselves a round of applause, actually, for being here. Um, pet retention is is one of those one of those issues that at the, at the at the front of it seems like there's no solution at all because you're looking at uh, a public in, in a lot of cases that has not placed animals in a very in a very hallowed place. So there's a lot of education that's going to have to happen between now and the point when everyone has a pet really feels like they're members of their family and that they are a lifetime commitment and that it isn't, uh, that they are not just um, disposable items that when they become annoying, um, they're just going to, to get rid of. It's one of my, one of the terms that I really hate in, in, in rescue is this concept of getting rid of animals. And people, unfortunately, even some rescuers use that word every once in a while. I, I, I would implore you to try not to use that term. Um, if you catch yourself saying, get rid of an animal, you know, give yourself a little, you know, something and, and figure out a better way to say it. Because we're not, we shouldn't be even um, in the place to be thinking about getting rid of animals. They are, they are sentient beings. They are beautiful creatures. They're creatures of the, of the world and the universe, and we need to be kind to them, and we are, in fact, their guardians and caretakers. I want to take um, Dr. Katz's uh, uh, guardian uh, language one step forward, forward uh, which is to say that not only should we be referring to um, our companion animals as, a, as uh, referring to ourselves as guardians of our companion animals, but we should also try to refer to them as he and she instead of it. And I hope that um, that if you you know come away from from this with anything, um, that one of the things will be to just keep that in the back of your mind the next time you find yourself saying it, referring to an animal at the shelter, it was sick, it got killed, it this or that. Just remember that. That's also part of the terminology that helps us make this uh, a much more dispassionate art, uh, argument and discussion than it otherwise would be when we use the terms he and she. Um, we had uh, a, a major pet retention issue come up just recently, which was the policy about relinquishing animals um, and the change in times that uh, animals would be allowed to be relinquished to the shelter. And I, I think all of you probably were aware of that um, over the course of the week um, through a lot of dialogue with LA Animal Services, the policy changed. But initially we came, we had a situation where the policy was going to be to s severely limit the, the times that people could relinquish animals. And I would uh, submit to you that all of the things that I'm going to talk about in a, in a few moments are the things that really need to be happening in order to make it so that that does not have to happen. We shouldn't really be in the position where we have to close the doors because there's so many animals coming in. We should be looking at all of the things proactively that can be done on the front end to stop animals from getting there in the first place. So the, the way to address this from sort of a macro perspective perspective is to ask yourself, first of all, why do people relinquish animals? And I'm sure that all of us have heard, you know, every excuse under the book. But there actually was a study in 1998 by the Colorado State University to, to determine sort of what the top five or ten, I think it was actually ten, but I'm going to focus on the top five, 
um, reasons that people relinquish animals to the shelter. So um, I'm going to take the microphone. Sorry, I'm going to come over here because I want to get some input from, from all of you. Um, just uh, off the top of your head, what do you think is the number one reason people relinquish animals to the shelter? Uh, <clears throat> urinating outside the litter box. Urinating outside the litter box. Well, that's pretty specific to cats. Um, how about like more general types of things? Moving, okay, We're, and you think that's the number one reason? Okay, well let's put it up here. It's actually two. Okay, how about another reason? Behavior. Behavior. Number five. Well that would be, that would be in behavior. Somebody from the back, yes. Sick, okay. There's two parts to that, so I'm just going to put the first part. Allergies. Allergies. Probably a little bit further down than five. Don't have time. Yeah, a little bit further down the list. Financial. Um, yeah. Okay. Still going, yes. Had a baby. It's not one of the top five. Landlord. Landlord. That's a good one, but it's not in the top five. Yeah. Okay. So there's only really one half of this which is remaining, which is too old. So there's our top five according to Colorado State in 1999. Too old, too sick, moving, cost, too many animals, and behavior, okay? So the first thing to do would be to look at our own city and say, within our community, are these the top five? And if they're not, then we should look at what the, our top five are because we want to address for our city our top five. But let's just for the sake of argument, use these for the moment and say, what do we currently have in our city that will address each of these issues? Too sick, too old. Someone raise your hand and tell me a program that we have that deals with this problem. The number one problem, according to Colorado State, animal is too sick or too old. What's the program that we have to help, help someone in this situation? Yes. Seniors for seniors. Is that actually happening yet? It is. It was just approved by uh, city council and should be up money shortly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there is such a program, but I thought for years that every year the rescue is up to the group of people who should charge a fee that should go into the general fund that would address that problem. Very good. We definitely need some kind of fund. Some kind of fund for people who uh, are in a situation where they have extreme medical costs due to an animal that's sick or injured, and their reason that they're going to the shelter is because they couldn't afford it. I'll, I'll give you one quick example. And this is more about the relinquishment counseling side of things, but you know, I'll get around to that in a second, um, how the need for rel relinquishment counselors within the shelter, people who can sort of interface with these people, members of the public who come in. Of course, this is an absolute last resort measure because they're already there at the shelter prepared to get rid of their, get rid of their animals. So um, it's not the most effective of all of the programs we might have, but it's certainly important. When we were doing, when, our, when the Rescue and Humane Alliance was doing its perfect match event, a few days before the event, I went to the South LA shelter um, to talk to Leslie about a few things. And while I was there, there was a woman who was relinquishing a, a cat. And she said that the cat was extremely sick. And so I started querying her a little bit. She was actually at admissions. Um, the uh, receiving area uh, with this cat. And I asked her a few questions, and she said the cat had only been sick for a day, 
and that the cat was throwing up a lot. And I thought, well, you know, maybe the cat just ate something funny and it's just getting it out of its system. And, um, you know, had, have, have you gone to a vet? And she said, well, I can't afford to go to a vet. Now, let me just preface this with, this woman was in tears with this cat. So I said, well, if you could go to the vet, would you, you know, would you want to keep your cat? And she said, well, of course. And I said, well, let's, let's just do that. Let's, let's forget about this for a second. Let's not, you know, burden the shelter with yet one more senior animal. This uh, cat was 11, by the way. And um, let's send you to a vet. So Don Paul, bless his heart, had the name of a local vet close by. Um, we sent her over there. I put it on my credit card just so that she could get it done. And the, I called the vet to follow up, and guess what? The cat had something, some kind of obstruction. Um, originally, they were telling me that they needed to do all these tests. They wanted to do x-rays. They wanted to do, you know, this and that and the other thing. I said, no, 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 no. Just do a basic exam. Okay? About an hour later, they called me and said, well, we don't need to do the blood test, and we don't need to do the, you know, the, there, there's just some kind of obstruction, and we think that the cat's going to be fine. So here's this, and it turned out to be the case. The cat had um, had some kind of obstruction, had, you know, eliminated it after about another 12 hours, and the next day the cat was fine. And by the way, the vet visit cost something like $60. So here's a situation where a cat was about to be relinquished to a shelter to be euthanized, essentially, because the shelter would probably uh, take the people's word for it that the cat was extremely ill, like on death's doorstep. And the whole solution was a $60 vet visit. We have to have some things like this to stop these situations from happening because I can tell you if I saw that situation just going to the shelter by chance one morning this must be had this woman according to her this animal was on death's doorstep so we need to have those kinds of programs in place and we need to have some kind of fund that helps people um, who, who don't who can't afford uh, vet care to get free or low-cost vet care number two moving my favorite one Everyone seems to want to leave their animals behind. Just had it happen to me next door. My next door neighbor disappears, leaves his cat. Cat's 14 years old and is black. You know, one of the easier adoptions. <laughs> so um, now thankfully, my next door neighbor has someone involved in animal rescue who lives next door, but not everyone is in that situation. And what happens to a lot of these animals that are just abandoned at, um, at apartment complexes or, or whatever? Uh, landlords probably come and have animal control take them and they go to the shelter and if they're 14 years old and black, they're probably not going to get adopted. So um, what can we do about this? What can we do about the we're moving problem? Well, one thing is that we have uh, a lot of educational resources in the city of Los Angeles and a lot of young people um, are very proactive about the animal issue. I don't know if you've had the same experience that I have, but when I talk to young people, they love animals. And the last thing they want to see is animals dying at a shelter. I mean, they just get very, very agitated about this situation. And I'll bet you that if we really reached out to the elementary school and junior high school community, maybe less the high school community just because it's so hard to put on a, a meaningful assembly at high school. I don't know if the last time you guys went to high school for an assembly, but if you go to the movies, you certainly see examples of it. And if it's anywhere as bad as that, I don't know that talking to a bunch of high school students about animals is really gonna, gonna work in an in a assembly environment. But, Junior high school and elementary school, it certainly would. And if we can get those young people thinking about these issues, thinking about caring for animals on a, you know, uh, for their lifetime and bringing them into the home as members of their family and all of those kinds of things, then at least that next generation will not have this excuse. I mean, this will just be not part of their thinking process, that they would just abandon their pets as a result of moving. 
Um, another issue is, on the flip side of that, why are they saying they can't bring their animals with them? Because the new place that they go, they're going to won't allow them to have pets. Right? So what do we do about this? Does any, can anybody tell me a program we currently have that helps to, you know, helps people in the situation of, 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 uh, going, of landlords um, having more uh, available apartments for, for uh, renters who have pets? Any, anybody know of a program? Yes. What kind of incentives? All right. I, I actually I think this is not a bad idea, but uh, as a practical matter, what I've learned in researching this is that the, the kinds of taxes there are that are city taxes are fairly insignificant, and that to give someone a break on those taxes would not really be that substantive. So it may not be something that gives them enough of an incentive, but I certainly think it's worth pursuing. Um, the Rescue and Humane Alliance is really committed to this issue, and one thing that we want to do later on this year is have a summit for property managers throughout the city, and getting all the property managers together and giving them a little, a little seminar about why pet, why pet homes are the best renters. People who have pets tend to be tend to stay in their in their apartments longer. They tend to pay their rent on time. And these are all documented things. So if we can help the, 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 uh, the community of property owners to understand that, having, that allowing pets is not like some horrible thing, uh, maybe we can open up a lot of homes. Because as you know, the, the cost of buying a home today is prohibitive for most people. So this city is going this way. It's going up. And there are more and more high-rise apartment buildings being built all the time. And I would imagine 20 years from now, we're going to look at a very different skyline in Los Angeles of huge apartment complexes that are up. And if all of those places are saying that they won't allow pets, we have a serious problem. But imagine if they said they will allow pets, how many homes could open up? We said how many animals are being killed? 20,000, right? So in a city of 3.8 million people, we, ha we need 20,000 more homes. I, I submit to you, we have them. They exist right now, sure. those homes. So we need to find them. <laughs> That's what we need to do. And I think that, that part of what we want to do with our seminar also is that we're going to give an award to the property manager who has the best pet policy. And if we do this on an annual basis and really make a big deal about it and make it a prestigious award, it won't be prestigious the first time we give it, <laughs> but maybe you know, a few years from now, then people will actually think, wow, you know, I want to be one of, those, uh, one of those property owners, property managers that is thought of, well thought of in the community as having a, a great pet policy. Right. Yeah, that actually started when Nathan Winograd was working at the SBCA San Francisco, and they uh, had this program where they offered to pay um, a property owner's um, deductible, essentially, up to, I think, $2,500 or something? $5,000 um, for property damage due to a pet that was adopted from their facility. And um, some of you may remember that Gary Michelson made the same promise at the, um, at the event that we had to introduce Ed um, uh, a year ago. Um, and I'm not sure what has happened with that, but I don't think it actually has happened. But in any case, it's not a bad idea to press that side of it too, which would be to offer this this fund and what Nathan says in his in his uh, seminar is that in in the years that he was there they never once dipped into that fund so it's a great it's a great it's a great offer of nothing essentially <laughs> it's an offer that is an empty offer because nobody ever took them up on it yes buildings with dogs in them are safer too buildings with dogs in them are safer yes
Yeah. Right, and and I, that's another one that I would like to tackle as well. It's um, it's part of the plan that um, that RHALA has prepared. That's in the back uh, for everyone to take a copy of if you if you want to if you care to do so before you leave. Um, but in in that plan, there's also a separate appeal to insurers because we need to have them relaxing some of these um, cancellation policies. They may actually be illegal, um, so we. We want to pursue that too, because if we can try to get some of the insurers to either drop entirely or, or severely um, limit or restrict their current policies for cancellations, you know, if you have certain breeds of animals, etc., um, these are all ways. These are all barriers to having pets that we need to solve, because these are the reasons the animals are coming into the shelter. The cost. Um, Again, on the front end, there's education, which is just that before people adopt, they need to be aware of what the cost is. I'm not sure if this is something that gets discussed at the shelter level, it ought to, um, when people are adopting animals. But they seem to think that this is just some fun thing and that there is no cost associated with it. And of course there is. And we should have a basic dollar amount that's the absolute minimum that you would be able to spend um, in order to have a pet. And if someone, you know, legitimately would, makes no sense that they would ever be able to afford a pet, they really shouldn't have one. Um, I know we do that at the adoption level for our private groups because we have that ability to refuse adoptions. But I think even more so at the shelter level, this should be a discussion that happens. If people can't, if, if people can't demonstrate any financial responsibility whatsoever, I don't think that we should be giving them the animal that, is, that they're ultimately going to bring back to the shelter for this reason, which is the third of the five reasons. Too many animals. This one I don't really understand, because if, you are, if it's your choice to have these animals, how, how is it that you have too many, that you need to give, give one, of, one of them up? Um, I think that the bigger picture about this, of course, is animal hoarding, and that's sort of a whole other discussion and a whole other uh, seminar, probably. Um, but one thing I would like to see us have in the city of Los Angeles is some support groups for hoarders. And I can tell you right now that, that one of the biggest burdens on the rescue community is when someone is found out that when it's discovered that there is either this horrific situation with hundreds of animals that need to be saved, or animal control has already been there and seized all of the animals and now they're all at the shelter. And what happens is that everyone in the community goes insane for about six weeks trying to help these situations at least. In the case of the Long Beach situation, it took a year and a couple of months. And I think that we, we have to try to be more of a community in this sense. When we see animal hoarding going on in our community, or we know personally someone who is getting right on the limit where they might be in trouble, we should try to help them before it gets to the point where animal control is summoned to seize all the animals. And um, that's just something that we need to do as a community. We just need to be aware of our neighbors and what they're up to. And knowing that at the end of the day, it's not so much about that person and whether we, li we like them, hate them, want them to go to jail, think they should be dead, whatever it is that we think, but that there are animals there who are suffering. And that's what we need to focus on. So before we say, I can't turn in so-and-so because they're my friend, it's not about that. <laughs> it's about helping those animals, and if that means that you need to have done something earlier, this is what needs to happen. We need to visit those issues and those situations before they become so bad that, that people are, um, that animals are suffering and dying and animal control is seizing hundreds of animals and an entire community has to be disrupted in their regular uh, business that they're doing and already that's keeping them up 24-7 and costing them their life savings, that they now additionally have to have this other problem. So I'm not sure that that's exactly the reason when, you know, for the too many argument. 
It may just be that people get themselves in over their head, and it's not a hoarding situation. They only have three animals, but they can only really support one animal. And I think we need to have that educational discussion at the shelter again, and, and in our rescue groups, as to what people can, can viably handle. I also like to ask people if they're planning on having a family. A lot of people come in who are young couples, and um, this is a good query to have with them about what their plans are, because are they the kinds of people who are going to use that for having a baby excuse two years from now? And better to hit them up front, and at least send them home thinking about it. Hmm, if we had a baby, would we want to keep this 300 pound <laughs> mastiff that we have, or whatever the situation is? Um, and uh, that's something that we can do at our adoption. The fifth one is behavior. Um, we need a hotline. Plain and simple, we need a hotline. We need a hotline that answers some basic questions about behavior. This is your cat peeing outside of the, of the litter box question and a number of other things, barking, chewing, all kinds of very simple things that we may have a very simple answer for or at least a few suggestions before people get to the point where they just have, are tearing their hair out. And I think that there's another component to this, which is, you know, people always say, well, you should, you know, get a behaviorist. Well, has anyone paid a behaviorist recently? Like, actually had somebody come to their home privately? I mean, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars. This is a real industry now. People are making more money as animal behaviorists than as lawyers. So we have a serious problem if we're asking people who are of middle and low incomes to somehow come up with a grand to solve their dog's problem. Um, I just don't think that's realistic. So one thing we need to do is reach out to the behavior community and try to get behaviorists to be able to offer some free or low cost services to people. And they should be working with the shelter on that. The second thing is, as a, as a subset of the call-in, which is an 800 line, presumably, or something, where you would call and say, and get a, a menu of different problems and solutions, but then some way that you could leave your number if, if this has not sufficiently solved your problem, and hopefully a call back from someone <laughs> to, to help you. Um, we desperately need this. So here's our five most pressing problems, and I submit to you that we need, uh, first of all, we need in Los Angeles to do the same poll and find out if these are the five for us. I might even suggest expanding it to ten. And then we need to have a program for each and every one of those things. And when we have a program in Los Angeles that answers the question that the top ten reasons that people are getting, our people are surrendering their animals, then I think we will have covered the pet retention problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Our next